Any sailor knows the feeling when the rudder is hard over, but the ship refuses to answer. You watch the gyro card, waiting for that first degree of swing, but the numbers stay frozen. The hull is sliding sideways, pushed by invisible forces, and the distance to the approaching steel bow is closing faster than your calculations predicted. The bridge goes quiet and you just watch the gap shrinking. We were entering a busy European industrial port, navigating a long dredge channel. I was the master of a loaded product tanker, 45,000 deadweight tons. We were drawing 11 meters, leaving about 2 meters of underkeel clearance. It was not a lot, but it was standard for this approach. The channel was marked by buoys, but the navigable water was narrow, perhaps 200 meters wide. On the bridge, I had the pilot, the third officer handling the telegraph, and an experienced helmsman on the wheel. The weather was the main concern that morning. A strong breeze was blowing from the port beam for six, occasionally gusting to seven. It was pushing against the entire port side of the accommodation block and the hull, creating significant leeway. To maintain a straight track down the channel, we had to steer about 10 degrees into the wind. This meant our bow was pointed toward the left-hand buoy line, while our actual motion was straight ahead. It is a common maneuver, but it reduces the margin for error. Before I tell you what happened next, please consider subscribing. It helps this channel reach more sailors. This happened in 1998 on a routine commercial voyage. We were proceeding at slow ahead, making about six knots over the ground. The pilot was calm, a local man who knew the currents well. We had a large container ship reporting inbound ahead of us, but the immediate traffic was a large outbound bulk carrier. We were scheduled to meet this vessel in a straight section of the channel. Usually this is a routine port-to-port -port passing. However, the wind was making things difficult. The outbound ship was high out of the water, in ballast, and was also crabbing heavily to fight the wind. Because the wind was from my port side, it was blowing me toward the starboard side of the channel, which was safe but it was blowing the outbound ship toward my side of the channel. The conflict began subtly. The outbound bulk carrier appeared on the radar about two miles away. Visually, I could see her bow was angled sharply to compensate for the wind. She was taking up a lot of room in the channel. The pilot ordered the helmsman to steer two degrees more to starboard to give the approaching vessel a wider berth. The helmsman repeated the order and turned the wheel. I watched the rudder angle indicator. It went to starboard, but the ship's heading did not change immediately. The wind pressure on our port quarter was acting like a pivot, holding the stern and preventing the bow from swinging to starboard. We were heavy and sluggish. This tour pilot waited 10 seconds, then ordered starboard 10. The helmsman applied more rudder. The bow started to move, but very slowly. We were now crabbing diagonally, trying to edge over to the starboard side of the channel to create a safe passing lane. However, the outbound ship was closing the distance at a combined speed of about 15 knots. As she got closer, I noticed she was struggling to hold her line. The wind was catching her high freeboard, pushing her closer to the center line of the channel, closer to us. The pressure on the bridge increased. We could not go too far to starboard because of the shallow water outside the buoy line. We could not stay in the center because of the oncoming ship. The pilot looked at the radar, then out the window. She is coming down fast, he noted. He ordered half a head. He wanted more water flow over the rudder to improve our steering response. The engine answered and the RPMs increased slowly. The ship began to swing better with the increased wash, but the speed also increased the interaction forces we were about to experience. As we prepared to pass, we were positioned as far starboard as we dared. The echo sounder showed the depth decreasing slightly as we neared the channel edge. Then, the hydrodynamics complicated the situation. As the bow of the large bulk carrier came abeam of our bow, the water pressure between our hulls changed. The displacement of her huge bulbous bow pushed a pressure wave toward us. This wave hit our port bow. Instead of passing cleanly, the pressure pushed our bow rapidly to starboard, toward the mud bank. The helmsman called out, Yay, yeah, she's swinging fast to starboard, sir. We were now reacting to the other ship's pressure wave. The pilot shouted, Midships, port 10. He was trying to catch the swing before we ran out of water on the starboard side, but the wind was also pushing our stern, helping the swing. The bow was heading straight for the shallow water, and the stern was swinging out toward the passing bulk carrier. 
We were twisting in the narrow gap, caught between the bank and the steel wall of the other ship. The ship continued its swing toward the starboard bank. The rudder was hard to port, but the momentum of 45,000 tons is not easily reversed. The wind on the port quarter was still acting as a lever, pinning the stern out in the channel and forcing the bow in toward the shallow water. I watched the rudder angle indicator showing 35 degrees to port, yet the gyro heading was still increasing to starboard. We were sliding diagonally. The outbound bulk carrier was now passing our bridge. I could see the containers on her deck clearly, and I could hear the heavy thrum of her engine. She was fighting her own battle with the wind, trying to keep her stern clear of our swinging stern. The distance between our sides was perhaps 40 meters, but it felt much closer because of the angle. My third officer called out the depth from the echo. Sounder. Under keel clearance, 1.5 meters, burnt 1 meter. The numbers were dropping fast. We were entering the zone where the water displaced by our hull had nowhere to go but against the mud bank. The water pressure between our starboard bow and the channel edge was building rapidly. The pilot remained standing by the radar, his hands clasped behind his back. He knew that the bank cushion effect was about to happen. This is when the water compressed between the bow and the bank pushes the bow violently away. It is a powerful force, often stronger than the rudder. If we stayed hard to port when that cushion hit, we would shoot back across the channel and collide with the passing ship. Midships, the pilot ordered calmly. The helmsman brought the wheel to the center. The rudder moved, but the ship was still heading for the mud. The tension on the bridge was purely functional. We were calculating seconds and meters. We needed the bow to reject the bank, but we needed to control the rejection. The interaction happened three seconds later. I felt a subtle shudder run through the deck, different from the engine vibration. It was the hydraulic fill of the water pressure lifting the bow. The gyro card suddenly stopped moving to starboard. It hung for a fraction of a second, then began to spin rapidly to port. The bank cushion had caught the bow and was throwing us back toward the center line. At the exact same moment, the suction from the passing bulk carrier began to affect us. As her midship section passed ours, the area of low pressure created by her moving hull started pulling our hull toward her. We were being pushed from the right by the bank and pulled from the left by the other ship. The sheer two port was aggressive. Hard starboard, the pilot said. His voice did not rise, but the command was immediate. Hard starboard, the helmsman repeated, spinning the wheel as fast as he could. We were now in a classic shear. The bow was swinging wildly toward the passing bulk carrier. The rudder was hard over to starboard to counter it, but the flow of water against the rudder takes time to build force. The ship's head was pointing directly at the quarter of the outbound vessel. If we hit, our bow would tear into her engine room or accommodation block. Full ahead, I ordered, stepping to the telegraph. I did not wait for the pilot. In this situation, the only way to gain steerage is to blast water over the rudder. The engine responded. The turbochargers whined as the RPMs built up. The vibration on the bridge increased. We needed that propeller wash to grab the rudder and check the swing. The bow of our ship was closing on the stern of the bulk carrier. The gap was narrowing, 30 meters, 20 meters. How would you handle this from the bridge? I stood on the starboard wing, watching the gap. The hydrodynamics were complex. We had the wind pushing us to starboard, the rudder trying to turn us to starboard, but the suction and the bank rebound twisting us to port. It is a balance of forces that you cannot see, only feel through the soles of your feet and the motion of the horizon. The burst of speed from the full ahead order finally took effect. The wash hit the rudder plate. The rapid swing to port slowed down. The gyro clicking slowed. The bow stopped swinging just as it aligned with the stern of the passing ship. We were parallel for a moment, very close, but the danger was not over. As the bulk carrier passed clear of our bow, we entered the final phase of interaction. Stern suction. Our bow was now clear, but our stern was about to come a beam of her stern. Two large ships passing close together create a vacuum between their sterns. This force tries to suck the two sterns together. Since our rudder was hard to starboard to fix the bow, our stern was swinging out to port, directly toward the other ship's suction zone. Hard port, the pilot ordered, anticipating the swing. Dead slow ahead. He cut the speed to reduce the interaction forces and reversed the rudder to stop the stern from slapping the other ship. 
It was a dance of timing. If he shifted the rudder too late, the sterns would collide. If he shifted too early, the bow would fall back toward the bank. I watched the stern of the bulk carrier slide past our bridge wing. It was close enough that I could see the welding seams on her hull. The air between the ships was turbulent, buffeting the glass. As her stern passed our stern, I felt our ship heel slightly to port, sucked in by her wake. The stern began to move toward her, but the hard port rudder checked it just in time. The bulk carrier cleared us. She continued down the channel, fighting the wind. We were left oscillating in her wake, rocking gently in the confused water she left behind. We were still close to the starboard bank, but the immediate threat of metal-on-metal -metal contact was gone. The gyro was steadying, but the ship felt loose, sliding on the mud-churned water. We were not stable yet, but we were clear of the traffic. The silence on the bridge returned, replaced only by the clicking of the gyro repeater as we tried to regain the center of the channel. The wake of the departing bulk carrier continued to disturb the water around us for several minutes. Our ship was heavy, but the turbulence caused by 40,000 tons of steel displacing water in a narrow channel does not settle instantly. We were floating in confused water. The hull felt sluggish, responding to the helm with a delay that was longer than usual. We were safe from collision, but we were not yet safe from the channel itself. We were still positioned precariously close to the starboard bank. The depth under the keel was fluctuating between one and two meters as we rolled slightly in the wash. The pilot checked the swing of the heading marker. It was drifting slowly to port, back toward the center of the channel. This was good, but if it swung too fast, the wind on the port quarter would catch the stern and spin us again. Starboard 10, the pilot ordered. He wanted to catch the swing early. He did not want to cross the center line. Starboard 10, the helmsman replied. I watched the rudder angle indicator. The pump moved the rudder smoothly. There was no hesitation. I had been concerned that the rapid hard starboard to hard port commands during the crisis might have overloaded the steering gear, but the system appeared normal. I glanced at the steering alarm panel on the overhead console. No lights, no low-level alarms. It was a simple hydraulic check, but an important one after heavy maneuvering. Slow ahead, the pilot said. We needed to stabilize our speed. The burst of full ahead had given us steerage, but it had also increased our forward momentum. In a narrow channel, speed increases the hydrodynamic pressure against the banks. We needed to slow down to reduce that pressure, but keep enough engine revolutions to fight the wind. It is always a compromise. The engine RPMs settled back. The ship began to answer the rudder more predictably as the water around us calmed down. We slowly edged back toward the center of the track. The pilot ordered a course of 260. This allowed for five degrees of drift to compensate for the wind, which was still blowing stiffly from the port side. We resumed our crabbing posture, the bow pointed slightly upwind, the vessel moving sideways down the channel. I picked up the handset to call the chief officer on the bow. Forecastle, bridge, I said. Bridge, forecastle, wrist voices, the chief officer replied. His voice was flat, professional. Check the anchors are fully secured in the hawse pipes. We took a bit of a roll there and check the windless brakes. Copy that, Captain. Checking now. It was a routine precaution. The vibration and the sharp shear could have loosened a brake, allowing the anchor to drop slightly. If an anchor drops even a meter in a shallow channel, it can snag the bottom and rip the windlass off the deck. A minute later, the chief reported back. Everything was tight. The third officer was monitoring the position on the chart. He marked our fix. We were back in the middle of the safe water. The distance to the next waypoint was three miles. The traffic situation was now clear. I walked out to the port bridge wing to look aft. The outbound bulk carrier was now a mile astern, getting smaller. She had regained her line and was proceeding toward the sea. The water between us was flattening out. The crisis had lasted perhaps 90 minutes of tension, but the actual encounter had taken less than two minutes. Now the bridge was quiet again. The only sounds were the ventilation fans and the click of the gyro repeater. The pilot picked up the VHF radio to call Vessel Traffic Service, VTS. Port Control, this is Tanker Inbound. Go ahead, Tanker Inbound, the VTS operator replied. We are clear of the traffic, proceeding to berth number four. No assistance required. Copy that. Wind is steady, 30 knots at the berth. Tugs are standing by. There was no need to report the near miss. 
We had not touched bottom. We had not touched the other ship, and we had not left the channel limits. In the logbook, it would simply appear as a series of engine and helm orders, but everyone on the bridge knew we had used every meter of available water. We continued the transit for another hour. The channel widened as we approached the inner harbor. The water became calmer, protected by the breakwaters. The pilot began the standard approach briefing for the mooring operation. We discussed which side to the key, the bollard arrangement, and the tug makeup. It was mundane, routine work. The adrenaline from the channel interaction had faded, replaced by the methodical checklist of arrival. When the tugs made fast, I finally stepped off the bridge to go to the chart room. I checked the course recorder graph. You could see the sharp jagged lines where the pen had recorded the violent swing and the counter rudder. It looked like a seismograph reading of an earthquake. I tore off the paper to keep for the records just in case, but I knew it would likely just be filed away. The ship was safe. The cargo was safe. We berthed alongside without incident. The wind held us off the key, so the tugs had to push hard to get us alongside, but it was a standard operation. Once the gangway was down and the pilot had signed the paperwork, we sat for a moment in the ship's office to have a coffee. The pilot was an older man, experienced in these waters. He took a sip of his coffee and looked at the bulkhead. That was close, and was all he said. The cause of the incident was simple physics. It was not a mechanical failure or a mistake in the rules of the road. It was the interaction of speed. Because of the high crosswind, both ships had to maintain higher than normal speeds to keep steerage. I had to keep six knots. He had to keep nine or ten. When two large displacement hulls pass that close at that combined speed, the water pressure forces, suction, and cushion increase exponentially. We had no choice but to maintain speed for the wind, and we had no choice but to pass in that section of the channel. It was a calculated risk that is taken every day in commercial shipping. We relied on the engine power and the rudder area to overcome the water pressure. Today, it worked, but only just. There was no damage to report. The hull paint was intact. The steering gear was checked by the engineers and found to be perfect. We discharged the cargo over the next 24 hours and sailed again. We adjusted our passage plan for the outbound leg to ensure we did not meet any large traffic in that specific narrow cut again, regardless of the schedule. If you've seen something similar during your career, I'd like to hear it.